Welcome to the Weekly Notebook Review. I am Robert McGrorty. This podcast takes on a bit of a different format where we are live each week on Twitter Spaces. I crack open my notebook and review Hedgeye research with anyone who wants to learn a better way to invest. We feature both Hedgeye power users as well as some special guests that might pop in. If you want to learn more about our research, visit Hedgeye.com. If you'd like to participate in the live stream, follow me on Twitter at HedgeyeRJM. Now, let's review the data. All right. Good evening. Good evening. We'll let some folks trickle in. Um, I don't know when it started auto playing music there. It's kind of a little trippy. Um, let's, uh, all right. So a little bit, it's 830. Um, I realize why I don't do these that much anymore because it's uh, makes for a long day, <laughs> but we will rock and roll and get going. If anybody's got any uh, banter, commentary, uh, questions, obviously feel free to jump up uh, and ask to be a speaker at any point. These sessions are for Hedgeye Nation, right? So this was, uh, for those that are new to this program, um, it's all about reviewing the the notebook and the signals uh, intra-week. So obviously only kind of two days of trading this week with a short week because of uh, New Year's. Uh, Monday was a holiday here in the U.S. and around most of the world. Uh, so happy new year to all and thank you for listening and tuning in uh but again just to get back to this premise uh it's kind of reviewing the weekend work and what we were anticipating going into the week uh kind of you know positions that we had on uh maybe moves that we were looking to perhaps make then how how had things play out and and any pivots and or kind of uh, further confirmations in terms of setting up the portfolio for uh next week next month next quarter uh, et cetera et cetera it's uh, the clock, you know, as much as we 100% uh, focus on cycle to date. And I see my good friend, David Salem, listening in. Uh, we I, on capital, the capital allocation team are massive, massive proponents of uh, capturing the cycle and trying to make sure that you don't miss a bull, a bull, bullish cycle uh, and certainly get out of the way of anything that's rolling over and turning into a, a um, you know, longer term bear cycle. Uh, one lately uh, or last few years would be China would be a great example of the uh, bearish cycle that you'd really want to be sidestepping but we will get into that in just a minute getting in here slide jacked um, David thanks sorry about that <laughs> but anyway we'll get back into it we got lots to cover there's obviously a lot going on uh, I think the big thing though again and, and Keith talks about this in the early look this morning so if you haven't read that I would highly highly encourage you to go to go read that and do so with diligence and 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 but um the high in the s p uh, was put in i think on last thursday and since then we're down about 1.6 percent and on the nasdaq the composite so the full thing not just the qqqs we're down about 3.3 percent um so that i think that high was put in on on wednesday the 27th i think that was uh so again the, this although there's a lot of bear porn out there on 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 Twitter and and what have you. Uh, I think you just really need to assess like where are we in in the cycle? Where are we in this uh, potential transition? Uh, it's certainly early days, and and you know this is uh, for all intents and purposes kind of um, there are some absolutely some some big time new things on the board like uh, negative gamma territory and a VIX that's pushed up to the top end of the risk range, um, and that level today that was really important was fourteen spot one one. And I believe we closed right, uh, right around, right around there. Uh, so fourteen oh three. So didn't quite get over that uh, closing threshold, but we kind of pushed up against it. Uh, so again, just kind of want to kind of reset the stage, I guess, or just sort of um, make sure everybody's really focused in on uh, making the proper decisions. Uh, and and I mentioned this on inside the arena, but if you go in and look at what kind of Keith did today, there's there was. A decent chunk of equity exposure that he put on. Now it wasn't what I would say traditional equity exposure in regards to, you know, spies and cues, but it came in the form of, you know, gold miners, GDX, uh, even some of the junior miners, India, uh, XLG, which is the the top fifty in the S and P. Um, you know, even EWN. So, you know, there's definitely some components there where you can kind of be building up your your long book and, and looking for opportunities to continue to capture. Uh, full cycle uh, longs on the board and you know even bitcoin right bitcoin had a big pullback today is a good really good opportunity gold too gold was a was a great one that was uh you know you had a lot of inverse correlations to the dollar that were pushing things to the low end of the risk range and and some of them kind of below the 
know, again, you know, just, you know, I think everybody on this call probably knows that, that those risk ranges are dynamic. So, um, I don't want to say that they're never really below the flow under risk range, but certainly below what was reported or what was on the page given, um, you know, yesterday's closing price volume and volatility. I think the U.S. dollar, dollar correlation is a, is a massive one, and, and we've been touching base on it the last few days. But when you've got a 15-day inverse correlation to the dollar and the SPX at negative 0.94 and gold at negative 0.96, and even um, you know crude, uh, sorry, uh, Brent and and commodities at uh, negative 0.64, negative 0.73, respectfully, uh, that's a lot of inverse correlation. So there's a lot of assets that are you know inversely correlated to the dollar. That you really need to be paying attention to, uh, and when the dollar is pushing right up against the top end of its risk range at uh, one one hundred two spot seven five in a bearish trend, uh, you got to kind of really take a look. Right? Um, is this a temporary, you know, sort of counter trend move in the dollar, or is this something of a of a new beginning? And could we see the dollar act a bit more in a quote unquote you know quad four like? Uh, regime or environment, and actually regain some of its bullish, um, bullish you know trade and trend components. Uh, I do have the pleasure of having the new levels from Keith uh, for that capital allocation will report on Friday, and I will say for UUP, we are both uh, um, above trend and tail, but we are below trade on UUP. So that's not a direct correlation to the to the dollar to, to DXY, uh, but obviously UUP is a proxy. And uh, again, just kind of wanted to share that we're below trade, uh, and, and just kind of barely, barely so, but uh, but just barely above, you know, trend and tail. They're kind of like a little squished together there, uh, pretty close in terms of going both bearish and bullish. Um, the other big call out, obviously, continues to be, and I've talked about this for many, many weeks, is just how close uh, the Y axis is in regards to the inflation. Um, so we're still calling and, and looking for. Uh, quad fours both here in Q1 of 24, and uh, we have entered that stage as and and quad three in Q2, and then a sort of slight GDP acceleration in Q3, in in a a kind of current estimate of a quad one. Uh, but I think it's really and and I had the pleasure of speaking with with David this morning or earlier today this morning, and not all quad fours necessarily mean a recession, right? So like, what does that really? Entail uh, quad fours are a deceleration in both growth and inflation, and so when you're going from a three percent print of Q3 and Q3 of 23, so kind of two qu- you know two quarters ago now, and we're going to start to get those new numbers, and, and Q4 is going to kind of uh, start to formalize. We get CPI and PPI next week on both Thursday and Friday, uh, respectfully. So that's going to be an interesting uh, component in regards to the inflationary side of the equation. Uh, but again, you know, going back to my GDP comment, you know, the the deceleration uh, again, if our estimates are correct, and and I think you know, we have a pretty good history of, of forecasting and now casting these these things, uh, you're you're kind of we're anticipating this is what you know Keith and the rest of the hedge guys are really setting up for is a slowing of three percent from Q3 in regards to uh, year over year GDP down to somewhere around seventy five basis points in Q2 of twenty four. Uh, now that's still positive growth on a year-over-year basis. So, will that be a recessionary environment? I don't know yet. You know, could those numbers get worse? Absolutely. Could they get slightly better? 100%. Um, but I think as time and space rolls out, you're going to kind of get to see, you know, how is the market pricing that data in? What will they pull forward? How quickly will they pull forward that data as it starts to roll in in Q1? And you know, you know, is a basically you know a haircut from three to call it one and a half at Q1. Is, is that a big enough shocker, um, I guess, what's the right word, um, kind of quad for like, uh, you know, market reaction that you're going to see a big drawdown? We don't know yet, right? I think, you know, you, you got a lot of key levels, as I mentioned, you know, negative gamma territory. So that really just begets kind of volatility in and of itself, whether to the downside or, or the upside. Uh, the last few days has certainly been to the downside, but I'm going to just reiterate: like SPX is down, you know, a little over 1.6 percent, 1.64 percent, you know, since its high of 4,783 spot 36. Um, so again, that was just a couple of days ago. It's only been a few days. We're early in the process, um, but there are things that are starting to kind of um, be worth mentioning and, and noticing. And, and Coach Keith did an awesome, awesome job running everybody through the Apple um, example on the macro show today. If you haven't watched that, I would highly, highly recommend you do so. I think it's a 
it was a phenomenal kind of summation of bringing all different pieces of, of both price, volume, volatility, uh, how it influences risk range, where the high end of the risk range is versus the trend level, uh, which again, I'll just tease that out, is uh, the trend on Apple as of this morning was 191. The top end of the risk range is 193. So it's possible that from a probabilistic standpoint that you get above trend. Now, will that level stay or sorry, will that risk range stay there tomorrow morning? I don't know. We'll have to see. I highly doubt it given what uh, Apple did today, given the fact that it was you know down another you know, 75 basis points or so. But we'll see. It could kind of still be around that 191, 192 level. Uh, we'll just have to kind of uh, you know play it by ear and and sort of adjust and be nimble enough to to change our minds accordingly. I think these these are really important times right now to be nimble, right? To have flexibility in your mindset to to kind of look at the data that's on the horizon, but still act within the signals that are on the page. And realistically, the signals haven't really changed, right? We're still bullish trend on the S and P. Or bullish trend on the Nasdaq, um, where you know, kind of, we're in a negative trend at the moment on the dollar, uh, negative across U.S. bonds, or the thirty-year, the ten-year, the two-year. Um, so again, these things haven't changed. XLK remains a bullish trend, uh, but at the same time, you have to kind of anticipate what's coming, uh, you know, coming on the horizon. How do we get a bit more defensive in our positioning? You know, a key way of doing that is just raising cash. Uh, so if you're uncertain, or you don't want to, or you want to kind of just let this thing play out then just raise some more cash. I think that's a very, very wise decision, especially after just getting paid a boatload of cash um, from a, a monthly distribution, whether you got a money market account, uh, T-bills, uh, whether in you know um, treasury notes or bonds themselves, right? And you're getting paid some of that, uh, some, some of that, those dividends in, the, um, in those distributions. But then on top of that, we have a go anywhere strategy, right? So we can go anywhere in the world. We can look at things like India. We can look at things like Japan. We can look at things like Taiwan or uh, South Korea, South Africa. You know, there's a lot of places that we can go. And so sometimes just let, you know letting things play out at home. And all, although it's not, you know, maybe it's not the sexiest thing to talk about at the cocktail party on New Year's Eve on on uh, on Sunday night, but it'll keep your hard earned capital um, in your pocket and it'll keep the volatility out of of out of your portfolio. Speaking of volatility, I think a huge thing, a huge call out, obviously, is what's been happening in U.S. equity ball. But then, interestingly enough, you haven't really had that same kind of flow through and read through within uh, commodity volatility. So whether you look at OBX in in regards to crude oil, yeah, it is up um, in the last couple of days, down from it was kind of trading in that thirty six thirty five band. Uh, and it's trading up at 38, but it hasn't really, you know, blown out to the, you know, north of 40 and that kind of thing. So keep an eye on what what oil is doing. Obviously, that is an inflationary uh, component. Steiner's been talking about that on the call the last few days in regards to, you know, what housing and or oil might do to the, you know, largest components or in in terms of influencing CPI and inflation. You know what what that read through can look like, and what happens if if, if oil. You know, maybe it goes back up to, you know, 75, 76, 80, you know, let alone $90 a barrel, barrel. You know, those are going to be, you know, negative pressures, aka, you know, push inflation back to the upside. And right now you could get kind of a lot, some easier comps on a year over year basis because of what, what we've we've seen uh, transpire in oil in regards to 90 down to uh, 70 ish um, in the course of the last uh, in, in Q4 of 23. Uh, the other, as I said, in regards to equity volatility, we kind of bounce back to VIX, VIX and, and RVX. Uh, so it's Russell Vol. Russell Vol is squarely in the chop bucket. Uh, the VIX is knocking on the door of the F bucket and VIX is kind of flirting with, um, you know, it's put in new one month highs, but uh, the three month highs are up closer to that kind of like north of 19 level. So that that's where to me, it'll be uh, really interesting. Um, right now, we're kind of just pushing the top end of the risk range, which was just around 14 and a half. Um, and, you know, what what will it do in a breakout, right? What does it break out to 16, 17, 18 and hold up there? Or does it sort of uh, falter and come back down? I think time's going to tell. And that, but that's that's the piece, one of the pieces that I'm really watching with the key, key and I is uh, what is that kind of like, potential new trend in regards to volatility 
Uh, what is that going to look like for the S and P and kind of U.S. equities as a whole? Is this again? Is this sort of like a complete breakout in regards to chop bucket for the Russell? Uh, it kind of certainly looks like it. And the Vixen is just going to kind of fail right at uh, at, at kind of eighteen nineteen here, uh, or, or continue to break out as well. Uh, in regards to to bonds, um, the move is still up at one twenty five. So again, the big thing here is you've got yields that have broken down and are confirming you know bearish trends, uh, but the move really and, and the volatility there really isn't kind of breaking down to allow you to get really sizably or kind of more traditionally large in um, U.S. fixed income. Uh, so, you know, we did add a um, longer duration to the portfolio today. I'm not going to leak that out for those that, that got that um, got that in their inbox. Uh, but, you know, again, those something that might be traditionally like 10%, when you got to move up to the 120, 125, 130 range, uh, you're really shrinking that uh, max exposure. Uh, again, you got to kind of follow your own risk rules and, and parameters. Um, but certainly for myself, if, if you got 120 and 125 on, or let's yeah, call it 120, and it usually kind of trades around 50. We'd well, be kind of like shrinking that exposure by about th- you know three times. So you know, kind of maxing out around somewhere between four or five percent, something like that on on um, on your uh, longer duration or really any bond exposure in and of itself. Uh, so beyond that, what else we got on the page? Um, Bitcoin. I talked about great day to add that that back. It's been a an absolute stud in the portfolio. I think some of this uh, general kind of commodity exposure, whether it be through you know something like uh, GXG or um, you know precious metals, uh, those are have been really good performers, uh, and uh, we get, you got to buy an opportunity in those as well. Uh, so the other component too, in regards to Ival, uh, this morning you had a, a <laughs> really juicy uh, Ival discount in GLD at minus 5%. So when we got that in conjunction with uh, the loan of the risk range, it was actually a great little setup to, uh, if you play uh, derivatives or options, a great, great little setup to add some calls. I know that's kind of counterintuitive and most of the time, well, not counterintuitive, but most of the time we like to buy things when they're at the loan of the risk range with an eyeball premium. Uh, but if you're playing the options game, it's kind of nice to be able to get both uh, potential premium um, going up for you, and then also, you know, if you're right on price as well. So it's kind of like a little double whammy. Uh, but again, for those that are listening in and are whether you're newer to the game or trying to execute in a more traditional sense, you would want to see a uh, eyeball premium there, uh, which you do have in spies and queues, uh, not so much in IWM, but uh, two times on. Uh, trailing 12 month Z score for Qs and 1.6 times on trailing 12 month uh, SPY. So, if you did want to get long uh, some SPIs uh, or some Qs and kind of more traditional US equities, or sorry, I guess the US equities that kind of outperformed um, most of the last year, uh, then that setup would be you're at the low risk range uh, with, uh, with an eyeball premium. Uh, however, you had ball kind of uh, moving to the top of the risk range. So, not a perfect setup. But uh, you can do with that what you will. Um, I think the FX for oh, the yield curve. Uh, that was the last thing I wanted to talk about today. Uh, yield curve uh, back down to uh, you know negative forty basis points. Um, so kind of acting a little interesting here. Uh, Ten years sort of uh, flirting, kind of in the middle range, the top in the range, top in the range is just just north of four percent. Um, you know, trading at three spot nine two. Uh, the Levels there are a little higher that are a bit more important. So just keep an eye on, on what's happening um, in that component. I think the amount of basically rate cuts that uh, have been uh, that priced in in December, um, it's possible that those don't come to fruition or that the market starts to fade those. Uh, so yeah, just kind of little, it's going to be interesting to kind of see what what happens there within uh, the fixed income space, but. Um, with that, why don't we take a little pause? And if anybody's got any questions or wants to jump up, uh, talk about what they're seeing out on the board, happy to do so. Uh, the one, as I wait for anybody to come up, the one area that I didn't kind of talk about beyond just the dollar and where it was at the top of the risk range, really had some good opportunities and things that have been working uh, lately in regards to FX and foreign currency, whether it be the euro. Or the pound, uh, but really uh, the pound's actually looking better than the euro. Certainly acting better than the euro, where it had a had uh, kind of a, a great buying opportunity uh, yesterday 
uh, rebounded um, a bit today. And so that's kind of maintaining its signal strength in regards to putting in a higher low and higher highs. Uh, so the pound's looking a little bit better than the euro. Uh, now, will the euro completely break down? I don't know. It's kind of right now kind of trading at 109 level is a key level at the low end of the risk range. Um, so just keep an eye there. Obviously, I think if, if the dollar pulls back, all those correlations are well, they're obviously inversely correlated, so they will uh, rebound. Uh, but certainly out of all those, the most interesting one, the one that's acting the best is the pound. Uh, the one that I've got in my eye, and the, you know, the probably I'm uh, watching very, very closely would be either a continuation of the USD JPY, aka dollar yen uh, to the downside and whether or not this is sort of a, a new cycle uh, that we could be witnessing that started in kind of uh, you know mid to late November and where it started to roll over. Um, so keep an eye on that. I think that's one that I'm paying very, very close attention to along with the Nikkei because uh, I may have been just spending too much time with uh, Mr. Salem, uh, but I'm certainly uh, looking for uh, a longer term cycle uh, opportunity within on Japanese equities, and if you can get the uh, currency as well to help you out, then it could be a very interesting one uh, to get a little double whammy there as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I think, well, why don't we just keep going to Asia? Uh, we keep uh, EM uh, certainly continues to stand out. Uh, Hang Seng and Hong Kong both are shit uh, and continue to look terrible and act terribly. Uh, so stay away from those guys, or if you can short them. Uh, continue to short anything uh, at, a, at a lower high. Uh, the Cosby is actually uh, looking kind of interesting. And uh, let me just pull up where we are. Uh, EWI. Yeah, EWI. Uh, still green lights across the board. Uh, we've actually talked about this on, on the macro show a little bit. It's one of a few um, iterations within capital location that where we have a positive, uh, call it like nine month outlook down up, out through 9 30, 2024. Uh, so yeah, so South Korea is looking really good alongside of uh, the UK, EWU. I know that's not Asia, so forgive me, but it just happens to be the next line down in the model. <laughs> but in terms of Asia, EM, uh, same thing. Uh, not 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 necessarily positive outlook at the moment, um, but uh, is above both trend and tail. Uh, same with uh, both Brazil and South Africa. So um, all those are looking. Um, pretty good at the moment which is uh, good to see in asia and australia is actually kind of sneaky getting looking a little bit better too uh and the canadian pound or canadian dollar excuse me is uh is helping kind of canadian equities and if oil can kind of find a find a footing maybe we'll see a little bit of a bid inside of the canadian equity space as well all right i know i said i was going to take a pause and then i went continued on a slight rant but if anybody wants to jump up, by all means. No, like, don't be intimidated. I'm just a kind Canadian soul from Massachusetts. So I guess I'm a mass all Canadian. Uh, <laughs> what else we got going on? Um, new signals. Uh, The momentum, so mag or magmans or whatever the the elite eight, those are uh, some new developments there. So Tesla's back to neutral. The rest remain bullish trends. So as I mentioned, uh, where Apple is trading at the moment below one ninety one, which would be its trend uh, trend level. Uh, likely that sort of starts to move the other direction. Uh, so again, it will be really interesting to see if some of these bigger players, which have been a big portion of the breadth, uh, and if you look at the tier one alpha data, you can see uh, how that's been playing out inside of their, um, I think it's their MACD indicator, I believe is what they call it, and and uh, just the influence of obviously the big players on the overall market. Uh, so again, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see if these start to break down and really start to lose their trend, uh, trend um, levels and momentum, or if uh, they can somehow find a bid. Uh, the other thing I did want to call out too is on the VIX and, and U.S. volatility. If you go back and look at um, how things kind of traded post uh, these these quarterly these big quarterly uh, callers that get uh, basically moved. Uh, the big one obviously is JP Morgan, 
And those colors uh, get adjusted, obviously, at the end of each quarter. So if you go back and look at what transpired post the June quarter, uh, the, what is that, the next one, the September quarter, right? So if you kind of look at how, you know, volatility, uh, you know, reacts post those and how dealers kind of reset things, uh, to me, this is relatively kind of normal behavior uh, at the moment. So again, I think, you know, that uh, if you go back and they just look the last two times, again, you can kind of go back as far as you wish, but just, you know, again, it's recency bias. Uh, it's certainly not, you know, investment advice. It's not something that you can really hang your hat on, but just if, uh, if sort of history repeats itself, um, you often do see kind of uh, the third or fourth day uh, where things kind of maybe spike or, or somewhat settle out. So I think, you know, tomorrow and Friday, are going to be interesting. Obviously, it's a shortened week. So when you have a shortened week, you got to squeeze a lot of that uh, component and data into um, uh, sort of like the, the the market dealer action, all that kind of stuff into a tighter window of time. And that can influence, obviously, uh, volatility and what transpires as well. So uh, as I said, you know, just kind of take, take an eye on things um, and, and have some patience. But obviously, if there's a breakout, then you really need to pivot and adjust your portfolio. And that's where you want to be out of kind of U.S. equities and, and really shorting it. Um, but if this is something where this is just a spike to the top of the risk range and we don't get much follow through beyond kind of 15, 16 on the VIX, uh, this is where, you know, it could be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, get along, get along the stacks. Good afternoon or good evening. Sorry, I normally do this. Uh, traders retreat. How you doing, man? Hey, what's up, man? Good to uh, good to see you. I yeah, good to see you. Too. Yeah, dude, I saw your space. I'm like, all right. And then uh, you said, and come on up. So I said, all right, why not? Yeah, yeah. It's a lot more fun when they get to chat with people. Yeah, dude. <laughs> no. I I know how it is, dude. You know, it's uh, especially at nine o'clock from the hotel uh, hotel. <laughs> where where are you at? I missed the beginning. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, so uh, you know. It's- down in Connecticut uh, t- tonight, so I drove down this morning. It's been a bit of a long day, but um, just grinding through it, which is uh, which is always fun. Yep. No, that's uh, what do you, so I know. Um, I pro- I'm sure you already went over a bit of the market here, but you know what you were just saying about the VIX is is basically what um, kind of what I'm seeing. I've seen you know, I try to keep in mind right with the fact that we had some selling, obviously. Um, it is the beginning of the year, right? And it's also, I mean, we also had the S and P go right up to our previous all time highs, and uh, you know, and test it. So, I mean, it's you know, it kind of makes sense that there's some selling here. But I do feel like, and I don't know if this is what you're getting at when you're talking about the VIX, but you know, they were kind of at a key level here. Um, some of the things that I watch intra intra week, you know, are the weekly expected moves, which are. Um, yeah, you know, it comes from, for anybody who doesn't know, it comes from the uh, options uh, market, right? The options expiration for a particular asset. In this case, it's SPX. Um, and it's the, it's based on the implied volatility, right? So there's mm-hmm. a expected range. And, um, you know, if, if you look at, you know, SPX basically got right down to its lower uh, dev- first deviation. So the lower expected move, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, 47.23. So we we did close underneath it, but you know I see that, and uh, on, as well as so, you, it's also spying QQQ for folks that don't know. For QQQ, we actually bounced the the low of day today was the uh, the second deviation right mm-hmm. uh, to the downside, <clears throat> and you know the probability of closing the week, and of course that doesn't mean we don't dip below it, but the probability of closing the week uh, under the second deviation is less than five percent. Um, I believe, you know, quote me if, or tell me if I'm wrong on that, but I know, um, you know, so it's a very slim possibility. So I feel like we're kind of at that line in the sand. I mean, is that what you're seeing here? Cause I, same with the VIX. I know you mentioned 15. That's, that's the main level that I have on it as well. I feel like, um, you know, there's still room to go obviously to the upside, but if we break over 15, especially, you know, 1550 is what I kind of have on my, uh, on my charts. Um, you know, thing we're, I feel like we're still within that range to buy some bounces, but man, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of tickers that didn't, you know, if they didn't break into all time highs that went right up to a, a major supply and, and have rejected so far. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm honestly, I'm kind of, I don't really have, I mean, this is the period of time and I recommend this to any investor or trader, right? Is that, you know, when you approach these all time highs like this, there's a lot of, you know, there's all this hype, there's all this, uh, you know, energy, 
momentum, right? But the reality is this is one of the most uncertain places to be, of course, um, in my opinion, at least. I don't know if that resonates with you or not. No. But yeah, what what are your thoughts on uh, as far as like, you think like, are we at that line this close? Or are you just thinking towards the end of the week? Or Yeah, no, I, I think it, we're, to me, we're very close. I mean, we're, we're sort of in a, in a, in a spot right now where on Q, let's just go back to Q's and, and your comment there, right? Like if, if we continue to break down on Q's and, and, and fix and so, so, you know, um, NASDAQ volatility continues to move higher and starts to break out, uh, especially, you know, into the, what we call the chop bucket. So that's, that's between 19 and 29 on the Vixen then you could really see uh some nasty stuff right and and some and some uh some folks kind of pulling their bids and or you know extra you know basically additional volume coming in and sellers having to um readjust their overall exposures um so so to me cues right now you know cues and iwm or cues or like nasdaq and russell uh, look a lot different than than the s p uh, 500 or spx uh, SVX, you know, to, to me still has some wiggle room here. Uh, and that's where, you know, I mentioned kind of, you know, going up, uh, you know, today's top of the risk range was just around 14 and a half. But, you know, to, to me, if you kind of look back and, and look at where, you know, price we've come to kind of as we push up towards, um, you know, up into and, and, and up towards kind of the chop bucket, that's where things will get kind of more interesting. And, and realistically that, that means obviously, you know, get more volatility. And we continue to get down price, unlike last week where we got a little bit of like up volatility and up price, right? So uh, kind of a different dynamic here this week than last. Um, and and that that to me is, it will be kind of, that's where I think there is just a little bit more, you know, breathing room on the S&P versus the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ kind of, you know, these this to me needs to kind of do something by the, you know, kind of, you know, next couple of days uh, in order to either find, find its footing or, you um, you know, this is something where uh, you're probably going to want to, you know, take your take your profits, right? If you've been long of it um, since, call it, uh, you know, at any point in November uh, to today. Yeah, man, I um, I agree with that. I mean, you know, besides the second deviation, you know, weekly expected move, and of course, that's all based on a a probability curve, right? Bell mm-hmm. curve. Um, where you know standard deviation uh probability curve so if anyone wants to look that up free but uh that level just so people know is 397.81 mm. um, and again that's the second deviation down so you know good chance that we bounce here um i do have you know i did have a weekly you know look based on the weekly charts a supply level right that the queues had had blasted through and that's the only thing that's holding me back with the queues or not holding me back but keeping me bullish i should say um is that you know it had such a an extended move to the upside you know past all-time highs past the the main supply really is what i i, I watch i mm-hmm. you know i'm mainly a supply and demand trader mm-hmm. <laughs> and um you know so that the bottom of that zone that i you know that it could that it, i expected a retest i posted about this um probably more than people wanted to hear but just to, you know we so many you know people think hey i'm just gonna buy it it's like look when you have a major liquidity and of course supply you know it just means like where's the liquidity right um, it needs to go back down and retest that liquidity, you know, really to gain some momentum. So once you get these big breaks, that's why they say both buy the pullbacks, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's just, a, it's, you know, seems like common sense, but I, I see a lot of people, um, you know, kind of ignore that, but you know, that goes down to three ninety five ninety one. Now, obviously, you know, it doesn't have to be on the dime or on the penny, but, uh, but I mean, it's, we're getting pretty close to that. The, the concern is IWM. I'm glad, glad you brought that up, man. You know, I would say, you know, the level I have is 192.15, right? That was the, that was the, basically the bottom of the, of the zone that I was, uh, that I wanted to see us close in. And, and of course, over, you know, 192.15 to 236. I mean, we've retraced, you know, quite a bit of that. I mean, so, you know, over 75%. So, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, what do you, what do you think, you know, I, IWM, you know, the market really didn't take off until IWM was doing well. And of course, I, you know, it's, because of rates, I assume, you know, the things that Paul said, do you see us uh, possibly chopping until, you know, the FOMC, which I believe is at the end of the month, right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. And yeah, I, I think next week, I mean, next week you got two big readings in, in both CPI and PPI on Thursday and Friday. Uh, so that could give, you know, again, a little bit of choppiness in the market. Um, right now we don't have readings at the moment, um, or so we haven't 
establish them yet in terms of um, we go out only to the fifth. Yes. So, you know, non-farm payrolls on Friday. Um, again, we are, we have partners called, you know, two on alpha. They, they do a lot of that, you know, um, yep. analysis yeah. in regards to, uh, in terms of expected moves and stuff like that. And so, yeah, just like, you know, we, we're only going out this week, but on the fifth, you know, it's basically a plus minus 1% at the moment in terms of expected move. Uh, and then the jobless claims tomorrow is obviously another big one. And that's kind of a plus minus 77, uh, basis point, you know, expected move potential. Uh, so again, it'll be interesting. I think obviously CPI uh, with kind of you know quote unquote quasi elevated. Um, again, I, I use quasi. You know, I don't want to be like VIX is still at fourteen, right? So it's, it's not like it's like thirty four uh, or twenty four, right. right? So it's yeah, you know, uh, but but it is obviously more elevated than what we've seen in the last few weeks. Um, and I think you just kind of got to take that with, um, you know, take that as a big factor right in terms of like what you know what moves you're seeing is like the ball you know the, the volatility so in regards to like iwm russell i mean the russell vol is up at 20 you know, almost 24 and a half um so it's just it, it's just a different picture uh than than uh what you're seeing in s p and, and even the nasdaq right which are still in the in teens uh so this move in in, in the russell makes a lot of sense uh or sort of like in terms of just like it is within its sort of expect, expected range and move um yep. but at the same time from the way that we look at it in regards to like a trend basis uh sorry yet um you know it is bearish trend it remains bearish trend the russell even with this massive you know move from you know 162 to, to 200 in the last uh in the last like 30 days basically which you know if you caught that i mean kudos to you uh and or i say that more broadly speaking, uh, although maybe you did catch it as well, but um, no, no, yeah. not I, 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 I was, you know, I was bearish for, I mean, and, and made good money, you know, being relatively bearish, more of a short to pop scenario, you know, about until, um, you know, I mean, spy broke, you know, basically what was it, uh, like 425, right? Or I think uh, 427.10 was a level that I had when we got the weekly close over that. And that was uh, back in May. That's kind of when I, I switched, but I was still, you know, we still dropped a few times from there. So it was tough yeah. for me. Last big run. I mean, you know, I, I day trade a lot. I mean, you probably know this. Other mm -hmm. people probably don't. But just, you know, so I actually stuck to that quite a bit because I just, I didn't trust enough to go long. Right. And I didn't like shorts a lot of times. I mean, I would switch something here and there. But I mean, it was, you know, looking back, it's like, hey, I should have, uh, should have you know, broadened my view a little bit. But uh but I'll tell you, we've, we've all have a bit of PTSD, you know, um, I use that loosely, of course, but a bit of PTSD, you know, from the past, you know, I mean, really from the past three years, but especially since, you know, since we, uh, the rates started getting raised. So, I mean, you know, and, and I think people need to give themselves a break to understand that it, it may take a little bit of time to adjust, you know, that if the market is truly shifting and that's if it's truly shifting, um, you know, I think with what the Fed's saying, it probably will maybe, you know, we'll see what he says next time. But, uh, but the thing is, you know, give yourself a little time to adjust without putting too much risk on the table because it is a transition time. And, you know, like they say, it's like when you're changing habits, don't make any big, uh, big decisions, you know, type of thing. So, yeah, exactly. And, and to piggyback off your kind of like look, look at a weekly chart, I mean, if you pull up a weekly chart on IWM, I mean, basically just made a, a, a lower high here, right? I mean, yeah, it, it, made a kind of new high in 23 uh but if you go back you know it's nowhere near the highs of, of no. uh, late 21 uh, and it, yeah it looks yeah. nothing and it looks, it looks nothing crazy. like any of the other big movers i mean you know you look at the dow it broke out a long time you know well weeks before anything else um i will say you know to get a weekly close over the 200 200 spot 36 on iwm is what i was watching was was big but what did we do? We went up and rejected, you know, the, I, I mean, I, I call it supply, but, you know, the liquidity above at 205 <laughs> to 207.50. I mean, you know, the fact that we rejected that so hard and we have this pullback, I don't know, man, if you look at the monthly chart, right, I have a zone at 202.66 to 205.27. We went up, we tested that and we we closed back underneath. And that's, you know, that the, the way that my strategy, and I won't get into it here or anything, but, you know, specifically like that is a, that's a bearish sell signal right on the monthly now it's the only one that did that everything else you know spy you know the s p the nasdaq the, obviously the dow all all closed you know uh bullish with with a bit of a buy signal but 
I do IWM did not. And I, the thing that worries me is that, you know, when IWM was ripping, you know, the markets, that's when you saw the queues really, you know, take off. Like everything was going great. And I, you know, tends to be the canary in the coal mine type of thing, maybe. I, I don't know, you know. Or is, or maybe I'm just have too much of my own PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm with you. I, I think, again, there's it just depends on what your time horizon is, right? Like in terms of uh, if, if you can be nimble and quick, then, you know, maybe present an opportunity near the low end of the risk range to, you know, take a stab at it, right? Yes, however you want to do that. Uh, but certainly uh, on a longer kind of more fuller, you know, full cycle type view. And that's why I like kind of your commentary in the weekly and kind of zooming out and even the monthly is, you know, you can really see that small caps are not, are not acting and do not fit the same in the same camp as, uh, as both NASDAQ and, and S and P, which are really driven by the larger cap, you know, higher quality, uh, obviously, you know, there is, you know, tech and some, some other kind of, uh, components inside of there but but for the most part you know those two are you know big cap quality names and that makes a lot of sense when you know because you got to have cash flow in order, to, in order to pay an interest that that's not coming at you at uh you know anywhere from five to twelve percent depending on what uh, who you are and, and what you're looking to uh, finance uh, absolutely dude yeah. yeah no it's great points well, listen i know you got other right. no yeah we got some yeah perfect um john weeksy you jumped up. Hey, Bob. How you doing, man? Yeah, how are you? How you doing? You're good. Happy New Year to hey, you, Hey, you too, brother. Um, I, I've been listening to some of this, and I hope this will this will help. It helped me. But after listening to a lot of this tonight, I'm going to channel Mike Taylor here for two things. <laughs> Without going into, hopefully, a, a, a diatribe, and I don't have on the jacket, so nor the robe of Felix. So... Remember Mike used to say, what do you see on the screen, right? Not not what you want to see, but what do you see on the screen? And he did that in the text of trade to make money not to be right, which has been one of my huge sins of investing, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so listening to everybody talk about all the levels and all the that's great. And what's the beauty the beauty of the hedge eye process? is you can take what you like to do and use the hedge eye process, whether that be AI, portfolio solutions, the calls on the call, all that stuff. The the you know, Keith talked to me a lot in the macro show in December when I was traveling. I didn't listen. Okay. So I've learned some hard lessons continually without hopefully going into the, the definition of insanity. But, you know, one of the things they teach you in the CIA is that perception is not reality. Perspective is what you need to look at to understand what's going on. And we have that with the risk ranges in tier one alpha, right? So I have that written on my desk. And I think the the way that a lot of us get frustrated right now, we, we forget about there's so much money, so much money still slogging around the system that it causes things that we, if you've been, I'm 63 years old. You know, if you've been a millennial since 09, you, you think 3%, 4%, 5% interest is a bad thing. But if the economy can't handle that, what does that tell us, right? So, come from the perspective and use the tools that hedge eye does to take those biases away and you can incorporate all that stuff the way you want to do it and the biggest thing that has helped me is to and i'm still struggling to do this but all the things that are going on the excesses that from the game stops to you know, silicon valley all that it usually shows up, and we've talked about this, in the volatility or the lack thereof, right? And to me, to be better at the hedge app process, I've got to understand vol better and understand how to incorporate it in the hedge app process better. Um, So that's that's all I've got for you, Bob, except I want to know if there's anybody else besides me that this morning noticed that Beolthi referred to ketchup 
when he was also referring to potatoes. <laughs> no, I didn't catch that. He was hard to hear. Well, you, he was saying catch uh, up, right? So uh, my yeah, my so thick mind got to catch up, but nobody your brain. nobody said it. Anyway, that's all I've got for you, buddy. I hope to see you soon. No, I mean, weeks, silly. You're not a good point. Hence why I've talked about volatility a ton tonight, right? Because it's it, it is the thing that is breaking out. Um, and it's breaking out across multiple factors, uh, and, and except except gold and gold ball is uh, is down. GVZ is down at um, you know down at, uh, just under fifteen at, at fourteen spot eight five. So uh, you know sometimes gold ball does need to break out in order to get new pricing, uh, and that might tell you something as well in terms of how people have exposure to gold on uh, whether it be through futures or or even uh, you know the underlying GLD ETF what have you right. So, like, expressing it in a big way notional way um it, it could be through the derivatives and hat tip to my to my boy chris um for always reminding me of that um so, so, submariners are a lot smarter than pilots bob so, submariners are a lot smarter than you know yeah we'll just leave it at that we won't pump his tires too much right now no, no. But, hey know, listen i'll i'll so shut up now but no yeah ball is a key critical component at the moment um really what we're seeing and uh, uh come out we finally got some snow so you and your family's right. rooms are ready so we need- all right sounds good buddy but all right we, we're picking up the snowboard uh this week for the for the little guy phonetic alphabet bob doesn't you say abc <laughs> uh kennedy i don't uh you jumped up to ask to speak i don't know if you had a question for me or, or traders how you doing hey i'm good uh I don't know if I have a specific. Well, I guess I do have a All question. Right. Um, I'm probably the, right. the most ignorant in the room. I'm not a trader, active trader, or anything like that. Just kind of more of a general observer, I would say. Um, my sort of position in the market is like I'm kind of patiently waiting on the side. I have cash locked in at close to 6%, and I'm just kind of waiting patiently i would say i do have shorts on um uh triple q and spy but that's on smaller positions but that's about it um i do live in canada so that's kind of my perspective and it just seems like this market this is like the most resilient thing that i've ever seen um i and it's hard for me to comprehend how we've almost peaked like again uh at rates this high um and as you probably know robert since you're also canadian like housing prices here although they have fallen a little bit are pretty resilient as well i think there's a lot of people waiting patiently um thinking that rates will drop and 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 maybe rates will drop at some point and and it's like, well, if rates do drop, does that mean people are going to start transactioning more and the real estate market will start um, bringing a little bit more liquid? Because at the moment, it seems like the market is just kind of frozen and no one wants to trade hands. Uh, my, my thing is like, well, what happens when rates drop? Um, obviously, Canada follows America, right? But if rates drop, does that mean you know, globally, like the trade trading you know, the average Joe start purchasing, you know, borrowing more money. And, and, and does that mean that the market overall will start to slowly inch higher and higher and higher? Like, that's kind of my, my whole thing is like, I keep hearing everyone saying, oh, the, you know, Fed's going to lower rates, uh, in 2024, like it's coming, it's coming. And well, what's going to happen when that, when that happens, does that mean that the market's going to go up? I guess that's kind of my general question. Yeah, no, that's a, a good question. And uh, X two I know he's an ex bond trader, so if he wants to jump up or anybody that's in kind of bond arena, um, if you guys want to give a bit more of a thorough or deeper dive answer, by all means, uh, I'll, I'll kind of tackle it from a high level standpoint. Um, like, right, the Fed has is kind of what's the best way to say? It? They're a bit between a rock and a hard spot, right? <laughs> so, you know, they're saying at one time i want at one side of the mouth that they want to you know get inflation down to two percent but then you know they are also kind of trying to navigate a soft landing you know whatever that means um and, and in terms of so you know they can't really so if, 
inflation and what we have what we're now casting inflation is basically staying or north of three percent uh somewhere between three and and three and a quarter basically over the next couple quarters so um we see that as a very challenging endeavor in in 2024 so you know what does that mean for rates and how many cuts can they do if they do any uh is the more are they just going to kind of let the market do it for them and they keep you know the you know the the fed funds rate up at you know five percent um i think time is gonna like will be the tell right will help you guide along this process um and in the interim our risk ranges certainly help assess like where is the floor and where is the ceiling and right now the 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 floors you know as of this morning was was four spot one nine on the two year and, and four spot five oh on the top end of the range so that really tells you again just to like round it off let's just say it's four and a quarter to 450 um so that that risk range right there is telling you that they've got maybe two uh two to three kind of cuts um priced in or you know potentially on the board uh that that could make sense within the current immediate term risk range um will that change as new price volume volatility comes in as the fed maybe makes additional decisions absolutely uh what does that mean for real estate you know the at the moment you're in a bit of a different environment um because of the supply demand uh situation that's in place right and i don't know it sounds like you pay kind of close attention to the process and uh, you may have heard you know josh steiner talk about this uh but you've got a lot of kind of millennials coming of age, right? A lot of millennials coming of age to that, you know, sweet spot of somewhere between 28 and 38 um, and looking to buy kind of homes for the first time. Uh, and you've got, you know, basically a lack of supply on the other side and not only for the boomers um, or really the boomers are kind of like the sole um, kind of ones that are providing some supply in the more traditional components like, you know, if anybody owns a home right now and they refinance within the last, you know, call it two years to two and a half, three, you know, two, well, I guess going back to 2020. Um, so three years now, uh, you know, you're looking at rates that were, you know, sub, certainly sub 4%, let alone if you refinance and got one, you know, sub three and a half, three or what have you, right? So uh, you're, you're in a very unique spot, I think, on the real estate side. And if you look at, you know, what, you know, one of the best performers year to date, or sorry, um, in 2023, you know, I did this over the weekend where I was actually looking at year to date numbers and, you know, the guy, you know, ITB was right in there in terms of the U S housing uh, ETF at plus 69% on the, on the, <laughs> in, in 2023. Uh, it was only out, it was only beaten in terms of it was in the two spot, but the one spot was SMH, which is obviously semiconductors at, you know, plus, you know, almost plus 74%. Um, so that's a big number, right? So, so the the housing equity certainly uh, benefited a lot from the situation, from kind of the supply and demand dynamic that's in place, uh, even with rates moving higher in 2023. Uh, so I think it's just going to be very, um, you know, traditionally one would say you're right, right? Like, you know, this can't be very good for ho- housing uh, with rates elevated. But you know, then again, you know, if you look at kind of more fuller cycle components right and you go back in time you know five percent rate or even a mortgage at six seven eight percent um it's not that far-fetched uh throughout kind of u.s history uh so i think you know i think it's just all about a little bit of perspective and who you are and what you're trying to do and uh, you know how are you financing you know your 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 properties and or your projects like if, if you're a real estate developer you might have to get a little bit more creative right if you're an individual investor if you're an individual trying to buy your first home um, you know, you just have to, if you don't, know, you just, you can't afford a $600,000 house anymore, maybe, right? You can only afford a $450,000 house. Maybe that means you have to move to Oshawa. I don't know. Right. <laughs> and you can't, and you can't, yeah. you know, and you can't live in Oakville. I don't know. Right. Like, so it's just, uh, you just have to like change, you know, and I think you, you know, the, the average person is relatively nimble, right. At the end of the day, you know, if they know what the criteria are and, you know, what, you know, they'll, they'll adapt. I think, um, you know, David actually, I, don't, I know he's still listening in. I don't think he'll mind me sharing this, uh, back in his days with, uh, Jeremy Grantham, a GMO, uh, he said, basically, I think oh, I'm going to misquote this, so maybe I'll stop. But basically it was the, the, the point of it is I forget the time period, but, um, 
inflation, once once you get sort of a, a steady level of inflation for a few quarters, um, the average sort of like consumer basically resets. Uh, so if you get, so we'll just use what we're now casting now in, in 2024 for, for US. If we just get relatively steady inflation here, which we're, we're estimating between three and three and a quarter in 2024, well, will the US consumer kind of like reset at this level and that becomes kind of the new normal? You know, we'll see at the moment, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of us just went through like the holidays and, and kind of having some great meals and stuff like that. Right. And there were certainly still a lot of conversations, whether it be at Thanksgiving or, uh, this past, you know, couple, 10 days about, you know, food prices. Um, but you know, is that starting to kind of level out and just be like, I heard a lot of like, yeah, this kind of is what it is these days. Right. So it's like, you know, if it's that. Is that what the new normal is going to be? I don't know. I and mean, is that going to be the new normal within the housing market? I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you made you made that point of like historically rates have been four or five, six percent, you know, for a large amount of time. Uh, but and then again, asset prices have never been this inflated. That's true. Right? So yeah. it's like, you know, four or five percent for a house that's, you know, a house that you bought in 1980 for 100,000, 200,000. It's like, Sure, that's fine. But when you have a house that's a million dollars, starting home that's a million dollars, one point five million dollars, four, five, six percent is like the amount of income required to qualify for that is insane, right? It's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, unless you had some sort of previous equity or or you just have tons of cash, it's I don't know. I just don't know. It's it's just insane. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm with you. I'm with you. And so Uh, uh, Rick, welcome to the program. Thank, welcome back, I should say. How are you doing? Rick? Oh, he dropped. Yeah, Candy, I, you know, I didn't, I really don't think I'm with you, right? There's not a whole lot more to say, unfortunately. It yeah, does. I mean, it's a dip, but it is, you know, it's a demand and supply. So, you know, it's kind of like the age old economics, right? And, and what, what, what's going to get reset? Um, you know, one would think probably price, right? In terms of, you know, supply coming down to demand. But if demand, again, I think it really does depend like on where you are. And, and, and I do think like the average person is quite resilient. So, like, if they can, go out and find, you know, if they, if they're smart enough not to stretch, right. And they can get away. I, I'm just going to use like a big Metro, like Toronto, you know I mean? That's where I think you've seen over the course. Well, certainly, you know, I moved there after school in like the mid, mid two thousands. I mean, areas like, you know, Brampton and, uh, Mississauga and Uxbridge and all these kind of areas and towns like around the city. I mean, those were not just suburbs, those were like the outskirts. And now they're basically incorporated in almost inside of the greater Toronto area, certainly Brampton and Mississauga and stuff. Right. So, um, I'm, I'm not sure where you are in Canada, but yeah, yeah you know, th- it's, that's, what's propelled those areas to continue to grow. Um, and you kind of, you know, to go across the pond, I mean, I think a similar thing happened kind of in London, right. In terms of, you know, folks going further and further outside of the city, um, as time, and, and like kind of the city um, real estate continued to uh, get more expensive and all that kind of thing. Uh, so I think the big thing within Canada in particular and, and many, many, many cities in the U.S. is going to be, you know, what does the infrastructure look like, right? What is transportation? Does it get better? Uh, I know I was just in Toronto, like visiting my folks. Um, we're just north of there. But so, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, new infrastructure kind of bills being passed. There's you know, new highways and stuff that are being built and all, you know, roads being expanded and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you know, I think they're trying to make it work. It just, these things do take time. I think that's, I just feel like something's going to break at some point and um, I don't know what it is. This is yeah. like one of the stupid feelings that I have, Fort, obviously Fort based, off, based off nothing, um, yeah. but instinct. Yeah. But I just don't yeah. see it. it. I just don't, I just can't imagine it uh going like this is just absolute insanity yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah go ahead go ahead 
if you don't mind, I um, I mean, it's half a question as well. But uh, you know, I was listening to a space uh, the other day, and um, one of the speakers, someone I respect, I forget exactly which guy it was, but uh, but you know, was talking about how um, you know, the Fed has gotten like they kind of got they started to get creative right after you know. 2008, whatever, and really even probably sooner than that. And uh, something that I've talked to some other people about um, previously in past months is is the idea of like modern monetary theory, right? I don't know if you're familiar with it at all, but it's it has, you know, and I'll probably butcher it, but it just, it's basically that, you know, the Fed can kind of inject, you know, they can point, uh, they can basically cr- make money go to certain sectors that will then you know, stimulate the economy basically. Right. And, and it's a, I mean, there's more to it than that. The idea that you can, you can kind of be the master of the, of how do I put this? You know, it, it's, I, I'd have to look it up exactly, but check out monitored monetary theory and tell me if you've heard of it. But the thought process is, is that, you know, it made me think that, you know, they probably have had this idea and obviously they have, right. We had QE, like that was, you know, relatively new, the idea of it. And I do think that they're starting to implement or they have been implementing new measures. You know, they talk about having like just these tools in their toolbox and that's all they can do, right? I mean, that's their, you know, it's kind of like all they have. And, but I do think the reality is that, you know, there's there's some unsaid uh, versions of that, or maybe there's they're more complex than they, <laughs> than they uh, allude them to be. You know, these, the idea that they can become a little more creative and, and stick money in sectors um, or help, you know, push it and not even, I shouldn't even say sectors. I don't mean sectors of the market as much as just, you know, sectors of the economy. Right. Um, and you know, is that something I don't, I'm not a proponent of modern monetary theory. I don't think it's, uh, I don't, uh, the little bit I know about it, it turns me off more than anything, but it, it does seem, you know, they, there's traits of that and it makes me wonder how long they can drag this on. Cause well, you know, basically what uh, Kennedy was saying, it's like, you know, I, a lot of us feel like this shit should have crashed a long time ago, right? I mean, it's, it's, or we should have seen higher repercussions, but look at the banks, right? They came through as soon as there was an issue with some of these banks, they basically said, look, we'll, you know, we'll be there to, to pick up the pieces, you know, we'll figure out a solution that'll work. And, you know, there's really no government governing body, you know, saying, you know, no, that goes against the principles, you know, we just have to let this work itself out. Um, and is that, you know, is that where we're, I mean, it's definitely where we're trending. Is that something that's just going to continue to grow as far as their creativity, quote unquote, right? For lack of a better term. And it's just, you know, will that kind of allow some of this to continue on? You know, I mean, because you look at our debt and I don't understand what, you know, I don't understand how we can get to the point of the debt that we have. Um, but it's, uh, you know, and I don't know, maybe we are at the end of the road and it's just a ticking time bomb, but man, it seems to be stretched out. It's like they add a few more feet of wick. You know, every time I think we're down to the last inch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good way of explaining it. Yeah. No, I, I mean, they, you see this across the board, right? I mean, if you look at, um, kind of response time, I'll just use it as that example, right? Or like kind of that word in terms of, uh, issues that may be arising and whether you go back to kind of the, the, pensioner issues in the UK or uh, to your point about, you know, the Silicon Valley Bank and, and the rest of the banking, you know, kind of quote unquote crisis that was on, uh, arising, um, you know, they, they acted swiftly and they put in a backstop quickly and, you know, that, that helps stem the issues and, 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 and the problems, at least for now, uh, you know, will it continue to, you know, will it be, an, will it end up being just sort of a, a bandaid on on the dam, right? And and it's going to start to leak and, and start to break down. Uh, I think time will tell. Uh, or will it will it kind of go down as, okay, you know, we end up sort of, uh, they quickly fixed a major issue and, you know, oh, didn't have, you know, there weren't any bank runs and all that kind of stuff, right? So I think, yeah, it's a tough question to, to answer. And, and realistically, to kind of echo John's Weeks' commentary, it's, kind of have to take all of that uh, on one side of your brain and like execute in terms of what you're seeing in the market, right? Like whether it be, you know, depending on your risk tolerance, your time horizon, all that kind of thing, like how are you going to um, execute and create a portfolio uh, in terms of using the tools that you have and the process that you've created? And I know, 
you know, as you've already mentioned, kind of a, a lot of the, the charting stuff like that, right? I, I know that I, I, you and I follow each other, so I know <laughs> I, I know your game, and it's it's a good game. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so I mean, I think it's kind of like you know, you can have these thoughts in your brain, but then also have to you know just execute without much passion and without much sort of you know like thought. But you, you I think you get the point, right? In terms of um, you know how to because you still got to make money at the end of the day. Absolutely. And I want to, yeah. you know, I do want to say this too, is that, you know, this market, you know, yes, it's volatile, right? It's, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, but at the end of the day, the opportunities that it's provided, you know, if you are at all an, an active participant, right, um, are, you know, I don't want to say they're, they haven't been seen ever before, right? But I mean, I look back historically and it's, you know, and I haven't been trading, you know, it's not like I've traded you know, 30 years ago and, and can tell you all these stories or anything, but you look historically and I mean, there's, there's been other periods of time where there's volatility, but I feel, you know, I don't know, it, it's, there's a lot of opportunity here. Right. And it's, um, I definitely appreciate your, your approach of that. It's like, you know, don't have the fear about it. You know, I do try to take advantage of it, you know, and with, within balance, obviously try not to, uh, you know, you don't want to, we don't want to convince ourselves of something that's not there don't want to have any real emotion that's why a process is definitely helpful but um yeah yeah and i don't i don't know i mean it does seem strange but it's also one of those things where it's like you know just keep riding the wave until it uh until it stops working you know yeah no exactly all right so uh just getting back to so david was kind enough to text me so jeremy grantham his key point was that stock investors don't mind high levels of inflation so long as the volatility of inflation is restrained uh, so what they hate is fluctuating or volatile inflation, which causes them to pay lower multiples to hedge against ugly outcomes, unexpectedly high inflation or deflation, both of which can really hurt earnings. Uh, so that's really what he meant. I extrapolated that to an individual person. Uh, so that's my fault. Uh, he was talking more about the actual investors and how you know they don't mind a higher level of inflation as long as it's not volatile. And that's something that we will or that that's what we are estimating or now casting here in the U.S. is a relatively low vol of inflation, uh, as I've mentioned, between basically three and three and a quarter percent. Um, all right, so we got Carlos is jumping on. I mean, that, seem, that seems manageable, right? Right, Bob? I mean, that's, it's, yeah. I mean, it seems like this is something, especially if the, if the jobs are, jobs market strong. I mean, I understand some, you know, the companies may have to, we may have to wash out some companies, right? Like there's going to be some that, I mean, there's a lot with high multiples. Um, there's going to be, you know, rotations in a sense, but, um, I feel like it is a, uh, there, there, there can be a, uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's, even if we're not like breaking into all time highs right away with a clean, you know, move up, that may not be the the path, but so that yeah. what you guys feel. I mean, as far as, I mean, even, yeah. You know, first, so uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we've got we we got CPI and PPI next week. I think JP Morgan uh, starts off bank earnings. I believe it's next Friday. Um, if it's not next Friday, it's the Friday after. But it's basically within the next kind of call it two two and a half weeks. Basically, uh, I believe it's next Friday. Uh, so you know you're gonna start to have earnings too, right? And and folks, you're gonna have to you know, they're gonna be reporting reality of Q4 and then guiding to 2024. Uh, so you've got a lot of you got some kind of potential positive and or negative catalyst on the board. And um, when you've got negative gamma, it just really instills higher volatility, uh, both the upside and the downside. Uh, and, and so I think we we really are in, you know, the big thing for the big takeaway midweek from kind of the end of week work going into the weekend, the long weekend is just, is it to me, the biggest takeaway is we're now in negative gamma territory, right? So, you know, higher, uh, a higher volatility environment and your, your VIX has kind of that trend has flipped, right? So we're up in the top end of the risk range. It's pushing up against, or it's kind of trying to push up against that 14 spot one, one level, which is really that kind of key trend level. Um, and so we're right there. Uh, and depending on where we go from here is really like, like this conversation next week could be a complete 180, uh, because either things, volatility has gone back to, you know, 12 or whatever, 13 and a half to 13, or we can be talking the complete other way. And it's, you know, not, I, I would be 
as dramatic as sell everything, but it's certainly, you know, get, you know, get a quad four book on the tape and you already kind of should are, have most of that, right? And or exposure, international exposure, as I already mentioned about, you know, EM and uh, X China and, and stuff like that, right? So it's, um, it, it's going to be, you know, right now things, things are working um, and, it's maintaining those exposures and just having the the wherewithal to look beyond the U.S. borders. All right, well, Carlos, I tried to have you come on, but I think you dropped, so maybe you had a phone call or something. Um, but I appreciate everybody coming up and uh, sharing your thoughts and commentary. It's always a pleasure. You know, thank you uh, for doing so always a lot more fun to have the back and forth uh, so i appreciate it yeah can i get i mean if you got a girl go for it and i and i'll probably step down after this but um and dude it's always honestly i'm glad i caught one of these with you because i um we do follow each other you know we've interacted a little bit but um we don't you know we don't not we don't speak that much i don't know i think no. I've, last time i spoke to you was like six months ago so <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. uh, yeah it was a wild dude so now this is this is awesome but uh what are your thoughts on oil um i, I was long cl today um, it played, you know, level wise, it played out great. Uh, have, I have weekly demand down here. You know, you could just call it support. You can see it on the weekly chart on CL, but what, what are your guys thoughts or, uh, or your personal thoughts on, on oil yeah. and, and anyone else's too, if anybody else wants to come up and answer this, you know, obviously it's, it's an open question. Yeah. So I've got the levels on USO and they remain bearish trade trend tail. Uh, so that basically, those are our three durations, uh, just as a reminder. So that would be three weeks or less is trade, three months or more is trend, and tail is three years or less. Uh, so on the on the ETF on USO, uh, that's bearish across the board. Um, on oil, what I, I will say is I think um, you know that low end of the risk range was basically right around 69 uh, today. So you, you almost saw that this morning. So depending, I, I, I kind of... Um, so I was pulling up the Excel file when you were finishing your statement. So I don't know where, I know you said you had a level, so I don't know where it was, but I might have lined, well, I might have lined up with 69 on our, our close to it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 23 to 66, yeah. 22. So yeah, you can yeah, see so, it, right? So, so right around, so right around there uh, was kind of like our level. So again, I mean, you're, you'd be buying it in a bearish trend, um, which isn't always the best, but when it's at the lower end of the risk range, uh, you know, with, uh, if you're going to be quick and nimble in it, then, then that, uh, that, that's a, that's a good setup. I think USO, um, you know, Natty Gas had a big eyeball premium this morning at, uh, you know, plus 51%. Um, so right now I'm actually kind of liking Natty Gas, so like from that setup a little bit better. Um, it is still, Natty Gas is still bearish trend as well, but, um, it's sort of kind of, found a bit of a footing here in the last couple of weeks and seems like it might be, you know, breaking out a little bit. So uh, that, that one's on my radar. Uh, the top in the risk range this morning basically went through it. It was uh, two spots, six, four on 90 gas on the futures. Um, so we closed or, or like we're currently trading around 270. Uh, so that one, I, I, I kind of, I personally, I think 90 gas, yeah, not person, sorry. The signal is telling me 90 gas is a better, potential uh phase transition positive but it hasn't quite gotten there yet so i i'm it's early days but if we get that kind of uh signal go bullish trend then i'll be uh looking to get long to natty natty bow yeah and i, I will yeah natural gas broke above the uh on the daily over the uh 200 day sma i know oh, it did okay i didn't I yeah. Didn't yeah, yeah yeah so t- yes today right was the uh on the futures today was the first close back above it now you do have hundred day SMA and the fifty day. I mean, I, you know, and I only look at the daily SMAs, but um, one and one or two weeklies. But, um, but you know, but obviously the the these are kind of general areas. But so you do have the other two. But man, getting back over it, um, yeah, uh, it was quite a heck of a move, man. Some people obviously, and, and you know, as far as oil goes, I just want to uh, the caveat to this is that. You know, if you look at if you look at the weekly charts, right, we had bounced off of that sixty nine level, basically, right, uh, sixty nine to seventy. Uh, Previous, you know, what was it for? Like a month ago, what was it? I guess, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was beginning of December, right? We came down, tested it, closed above. We retested it and bounced, and this was this was just a second retest of per se. 
So the risk to reward as far as the trade was there, but yeah, that's why I was kind of, I'm, I'm interested. And I mean, you answered it for sure, but that, um, because I mean, you know, this is, that was more of a trade than like saying, Hey, I'm going to get long, you know, oil for the next like six months or something. You know what I mean? That's not, not at all what I was, what I was getting in. So yeah, the, the beauty set of today that again, I think if you're following certainly our agile process, if you didn't buy gold, like hand over fist this morning, um, you need to reevaluate how you, what you did. Uh, so it, is, it was, I bought, I, I, uh, bought a chunk, a big chunk. I was waiting on some GLD to really get it grossed up to my max position on the underlying. And then I added, uh, calls as well. Um, so it was, uh, it, it it's looking like that was potentially the right move. It got right now the low of the risk range, which was 2039, uh, now turning around 2050. So I, I, I personally don't always love sharing like the individual trades because it's like much more about kind of like the bigger picture and process, but that's what I did in my book in, uh, in my PA in the day is, uh, I added, uh, took gold in my max and added some gold calls. <laughs> and they were short dated. They were one one nineteen. One nineteen uh was it one nineteen uh, yeah. just yeah, like uh, what, what, sorry, one nineteen to one eighty nine. Uh one nineteen to one eighty nine. It's basically at the money or slightly uh you know, basically at the money when I put a little bit above that when I uh, put them on. But uh, anyway. Not all <laughs> trades are not all trades are good ones, but that one hopefully and again if everyone was paying attention, that was something they should have been doing. I mean, I think that's, yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, it had a nice, had a nice pullback right after, I mean, not major, but, um, definitely saw, you know, looking at the weekly chart, man, GLD, you know, it closed. I mean, it was a few, it was what a month ago, I guess now, mm-hmm. but you know, that close over, uh, was it one ninety eighty one? Like yeah, that's, yeah. It, and then even last week, right. We held over it and closed. So like, I'm, I do feel you on that dude. That's, um, <laughs> though that, I mean, it has not done that right since, since, the high was created, you know, back in, uh, in 2020. I mean, yep. you know, so yeah, no, really that's, that's the thing. I am kind of excited for some of these charts. Obviously I, I don't, you know, I, I go out of my way to not let my emotions trade, you know, play in <laughs> these, but I mean, I do, I, I do, you know, I, I have a sense of, uh, kind of satisfaction if we, you know, if we kind of get out of this turmoil and, and can continue to make some gains, right. It's nice to be, in a market that may, you know, at least even parts of the market, and obviously not even the whole market, but different, different sectors that, you know, I can get long in and, and stay long. Cause, uh, probably just, I don't know, maybe cause I did so much intraday the last uh, year or two, but, um, but yeah, anyways, man, I'll, I am yeah. watching, I'm going to keep an eye on, I did not get in it today, but I also, um, you know, I will, I will take that on the face though. Cause I think you're right. In the, in healthcare, uh, healthcare is looking, again, didn't really have much of a pullback today, obviously, but, um, well, I don't think so, at least. But that we, I mean, the weekly chart on on the XLV uh, pulled back a little bit, but certainly, you know, kind of uh, still at the top of the risk range, kind of you know, close to the top of the risk range. So, um, but yeah, I mean, any kind of you know, healthcare to me is really start to gain a lot of positive signal strength as well. So, uh, put that one on the radar as well. Yeah, I, we were looking at UNH, and actually, I was. Uh, oh yeah. 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 I was a bit bearish, dude, uh, a couple, uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I guess, um, just because of, you know, where we closed, although it did hold the 100 day SMA. But, uh, mm-hmm. but I, you know, anyways, that this week has been quite the, uh, quite the recovery. There's definitely been a bit of a ro- rotation into, um, into healthcare. You know, we kind of saw that beginning of the week. I heard, I, I heard someone mention it. I didn't, you know, unfortunately, I didn't, uh, I didn't jump in anything. I don't, I mean, even with the day trading, I try not to, case too much um if i'm not prepared for it you know that's where yeah. i make I, my biggest mistakes so for sure for sure you know but uh anyways well listen man yeah i'm gonna right, hop yeah, down but uh, i you. Yeah, yeah. i appreciate right, everything carlos was able to jump on all, all right carlos why don't we uh wrap the evening with you thanks Rob. yeah how are you carlos oh i'm doing good uh just good. Kind of getting back into the swing of things. Uh, oh, nice. You know, holidays and New Year's. and But I apologize. I'm going to go listen to the spaces afterwards. Oh, I, I've probably only listened to probably the last 10 minutes. But uh, I guess trader-wise and you talking. So Yeah, nice. 
Perfect. Did you have a question though? Did you have a question? That you want to I, I do have a question, yeah. but um, I just, I kind of want to, um, as far as the oil conversation that y'all are having, yeah. uh, of course, the signal told you, you know, what oil was doing, but just, I'm going to add my commentary and fundamental analysis on this. Um, just, you know, we had, uh, mergers and acquisitions, the biggest being Exxon Mobil and Pioneer. Yeah. So what all these small shale drillers are doing is increasing production. And you could that's in the data. You could see that we are actually under Biden. We're still increasing production because all these small players want to be taken over. They want to be uh, bought out at really high prices. So that's what they're doing. They're increasing production right now. And I'm kind of in that area in Texas and they are drilling. So it's interesting. So I know that's narrative and fundamental analysis or whatever, (laughs) but (laughs) hey, the signal the signal uh uh caught it out before that you know yeah, so yeah uh, but yeah they they want to uh there's a lot of m a uh talks going on and that might be the reason why oil uh the commodity is not doing so good because yeah. lots of people are uh trying to get the numbers up so they could get a higher price for their stock yeah for sure and yeah. uh so it's interesting you mentioned that because like it, um AM, yep. mlp right right with so the the mlp the etf right it's it it kind of popped up on my radar uh this afternoon um because it's up about a percent on a week over week basis and it's one of the better better performers in in a down tape and even with oil kind of going you know, call it slightly up or uh, sideways on a week over week basis. So it's uh, that that was something that I kind of circled in, in the old notebook. And so uh, AM- yeah, again, like like XLE is also about you know one percent, and we actually shorted Dex Energy today uh, in RTAs. But um, yeah, so uh, so that should also tell you uh, yeah what we think about energy is that this this is just the beginning of continuation of the downside and, and the lack of demand, or maybe even just more supply. To your point, Carlos. Um, they, they both, uh, they both yep. will hurt price. Well, AMLP is a pipeline, right? No, that's the, um, that's the ETF for, um, the pipeline. The, 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 no, it's the MLPs. It's, oh, uh, yeah, it's the ETF for the MLP. So it's the, uh, Illyrian MLP ETF. So it's got a bunch of different MLPs, um, inside of it as holdings. Yeah. So it's kind of like a proxy that kind of more the, uh, where did those, those guys, um, have the yeah. the revenue stream what's it called uh the pipeline yeah so like energy yeah. transfer uh enterprise um kinder morgan yeah like yeah those all, exactly yeah okay so why why are the why are the pipeline companies making more money because there's more volume going through the pipelines makes sense why is carlos it- makes sense there you go. Connecting the, you're connecting the dots, Carlos. <laughs> connecting the dots. There you go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but uh, so um, I just uh, I did want to ask, and y'all might have talked about it, but um, what what Hedgeye's view is on inflation next three six months? I'm mean, yeah. I Don't I? I again, I've been on vacation, holidays. I've uh, been in touch. So, yeah, yeah no, I mean, we're kind of getting a refresh from you. Yeah, no, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, the inflationary numbers are sticking relatively uh, unchanged at the moment over the last kind of, call it, week or two. We just haven't had a whole lot of data that they have right. yeah. at the moment, right? So, um, next week, we'll have the updated CPI and PPI numbers on Thursday and Friday. Uh, at the moment, we're basically, again, I'm rounding it off, Carlos, but you're you're basically kind of seeing inflation uh for q4 of like so basically what's going to be uh, continues to be estimates at the moment but we'll turn into actuals obviously uh but we we don't have q4 of 
24 out yet. So we just have basically uh, this past quarter and then the next three quarters. And, and it's basically in a range of three to three and a quarter um, just for, for simple math standpoint. So kind of like what it's actually three to three, it's 320, 320 basis points. So um, kind of right around right around three, again, just for simplicity, three to three and a quarter kind of percent over the next couple of quarters. So we'll see. I, I, we don't have the estimate yet for Q4. Um, but that's kind of, you know, it, it's really, inflation is really oscillating kind of right on the Y axis. If you kind of think about it from how our quads are set up in, in terms of, you know, some new data or, you know, housing prices kind of falling or rising or oil kind of catching a bit and moving back up to, you know, the eighties or, or let alone the nineties, right. They could push inflation kind of a little bit higher, but at the moment, uh, what we're seeing is is really this sort of very tight um, kind of a small delta between inflation on a quarterly basis and even um, on a monthly basis. You know, it's, it will basically have kind of quad four and quad threes, and those quad threes could turn into a quad four if you get slight deceleration in inflation. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what we're seeing over the next few quarters while growth is really the one with much larger deltas in terms of, um, you know, where we've come from, which was 3% in Q3 and where we think we're headed, which is about 73 basis points in Q2 of 24. Uh, and then kind of that, that, that's sort of what we're anticipating as the, as the trough and then a bit of a rebound or an acceleration in Q3 up to, uh, around 110 basis points. And and this right. In Q324, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah. kind of kind of what I'm hearing is, you know, a little bit of disinflation for the first half and then kind of re-accelerating the inflation in the second half? Or am uh, I... Yeah, yeah, I mean, inflation's I kind of staying relatively flat. Right, yeah. yeah. Same. Yeah, it's same. more the, the growth, the growth, the, the GDP number on the year-over-year basis. That's the piece that's really... Um, that's gonna that that's more of the drop. Gonna be hard to beat what, in the first. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's gonna be kind of you know that that you got a lot of tough comps and um yep. and so so those year over year numbers uh, are likely going to be decelerating. Um, yeah. So so but but still positive. That that's kind of what we're seeing on, on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, All right. Good stuff. Right. Thanks for popping up, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for your insight in uh, Texas. It's always good to good to have. Uh, those folks on the ground uh yeah, it's always a pleasure um but yeah thanks again for everybody for for jumping up it's been uh it's been a fun night so uh, yeah we'll have to run it back in the next couple of weeks and we'll see everybody else i think next wednesday gotta be more of a regular time probably uh either 12 30 or 4 30 uh on next wednesday we'll have, a, have another notebook review but thank you everybody for joining us and good luck out there trading don't forget to check out Hedgeye.com to get more actionable investing insights from our team of more than 40 research analysts. And check us out on Twitter at our handle, at Hedgeye. This presentation is informational only. None of the information contained herein constitutes an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any security or investment vehicle, nor does it constitute investment recommendation or legal tax accounting or investment advice by Hedgeye or any of its employees, officers, agents, or guests. This information is presented without regard for individual investment preferences or risk parameters and is general, non-tailored, non-specific information. This content is based on information from sources believed to be reliable. Hedge is not responsible for errors and accuracies or omissions of information. The opinions and conclusions contained in this report are those of the individual expressing those opinions and conclusions and are intended solely for the use of Hedge subscribers and the authorized recipients of the content. All investments entail a certain degree of risk and financial instrument prices can fluctuate based on several factors, including those not considered in the preparation of the content. Consult your financial professional before investing. The information contained herein is protected by United States and foreign copyright laws and is intended solely for the use of its authorized recipient. Access must be provided directly by Hedge Redistribution or republication is strictly prohibited. For more detail, please refer to the terms of service at hedgeye.com slash terms of service. 